so let's continue the great momentum from our first speaker. Okay, so the title of our talk here is Modernizing 20 Year Legacy. So by 20 Year Legacy, we're referring to our Sumpi application that has been around for 20 years. And by modernizing, we aim to rewrite the application based on issues that we have faced over the last few years. Okay. So, so first off, just a brief introduction. So uh, over here, I have Amu. Uh, my name is Wei Yuan. Okay. Showing up. So yeah, we're full stack engineers from Rakuten Viki. Okay, first question. What is Sumpi? To describe it with one word, K-pop. Okay. So it's a publication platform that aims to deliver the latest news for K-pop, for K-pop fans. Okay. And referencing the 20-year legacy, you can see, so this is a screen grab of how it looked like in 1999, very much reminiscent of a site in the era. Okay. And moving forward to today, uh, so this is a screen grab in recent years before we did the rewrite. So you can see it looks relatively modernized, and this was when it was deployed on WordPress. Okay, so now that we have seen the site itself, you know, it looks relatively modernized. Why is there a need for us to perform this rewrite? Okay, so the answer lies beneath the application in the issues that we faced. Okay, the first issue, legacy code as well as leaky plugins. So we found that, you know, over time, we had a lot of legacy codes. That was because of uh, developers, you know, when they join the project, they install WordPress plugins, you know, plugins after plugins. So we have a, a lot of redundant code that build up across time that we didn't refactor out. And we even faced issues where we had WordPress plugins that had circular dependencies with each other. So even harder refactor. As for leaky plugins, uh, we're referring to the nature of WordPress plugins. So let's compare that to something like uh, a different package uh, system like Node module. So for Node module, you have a package that's isolated in code. So it's like a black box. You put in some input, it passes out some expected output. But if you compare this, back to WordPress plugins. We see that our WordPress plugins could do, had a lot of privileges, you know, it could change something on the view, at the same time, it could change something in the CSS, the styling of a page, the themes, it could even change something in a database, drop tables, add data, you know, with all these privileges. And then you have all these plugins put on top of one another. So you end up with a situation where the plugins were no longer a black box, the application was the black box. Okay, so this led, to the situation where we found out that the application was becoming you know, less and less efficient. And this was with in conjunction of you know, K-pop being more popular in recent years. So you get increased readership in the site. And there are situations where you, know, you get breaking news. Some celebrity you know, announcing that they're dating some other celebrity. So at that time period, you get a huge influx of traffic to our site uh, at a short period of time you know, from different social media platforms. So when that happened, we get uh, we experience disruptions, slowdowns. So for each incident, we will dispatch engineers to you know solve the problem, uh, fix it, deploy some solutions. But these issues were iterating over time, and we found out that you know we're just solving things in the short term. So we had to do something to solve it in the long term. Okay. So there's two solutions that we could take. Either we can refactor our redundant code away from our system, you know, take away all those redundant plugins that we build in over time or we can look at refract, uh, rewriting the application. And what compelled us towards looking at the rewrite was because of prototypes that we built within the team, you know, other services that uh, we have built. For example, you have Sumpi Awards over here, which was a single page application built using React Router, where we could see the benefits of uh, how a single page application could benefit in terms of performance to the end users. Okay. So now that we have decided with doing a rewrite, we wanted to set some goals. What do we want to achieve with this rewrite? Okay. So firstly, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, creating a isomorphic app, single page application. Okay. The second point is independent page optimizations. So these are pockets of knowledge that the team has built up, you know, experimenting with different technologies on different services. So why not put them all together, accumulate the benefits in this one single rewrite? Okay. And lastly, we decided that we wanted to use uh, GCP App Engine as our choice of infrastructure because of the observation for other microservices that we developed that it was very easy to configure an uh, auto-scale application. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to hand over to Amu, who's going to be talking about uh, the rewrite experience. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's actually my first time uh, doing a talk here in Singapore. 
So um, actually, pr pretty nervous. <laughs> okay. So um, rewrite time. Right. Looks like Power Rangers, right? Okay. So let's start with um, isomorphic app. So if we think about isomorphic app um, in terms of JavaScript, what does that actually mean? Okay. So normally JavaScript only runs on client side, right? We all know that. I mean, it only runs on the browser. So. And it, it, it uses your, um, your browser's computing power to calculate things, to render and do stuff um, with your code. So, but with the advent of Node.js, um, it, it actually became a very compelling server-side um, language as well, right? So, and plus, by, by doing um, isomorphic app, um, we also eliminated the... Um, uh, the, the problem of context switching. So for example, if you're using Ruby for your backend and then you're using React for your front end, so everyone will just, oh, this is Ruby. Oh, this is um, React. Oh, this is Ruby, this is React. So we eliminated all that by just doing all the way JavaScript um, through everything. Okay, so, so we, as we said, like it's, um, it's a universal JavaScript application, so everything is in JavaScript. And by doing that, sometimes, your bundle file can blow up so easily. It, it could go from starting from 1 MB, and the, the next week it goes 2 MB, and then 4 MB, and then 5 MB. And you don't want you, for your application to do that. It's going to take a while for it to load. It's going to take like 10 seconds for your application to render. So what we did is we um, did code splitting to make it more faster. And it only loads what your page needs. So it, when it goes to the home page, it only needs the chunk loads the chunk that the home page needs and not um, <clears throat> not all the JS files okay so later on I'm gonna um, show a demo on how this this thing works but okay so now we are isomorphic and now we code split um, what is the next step okay. next step is um, we also want it to be SPA so we don't want the page to load so you know with with a normal um, web application you click on the next page it reloads the entire site, loads all your assets again, like JS, CSS, and then renders your page. We do also don't want that to happen to our rewrite. So we want everything to be very performant. So by going SPA, um, we improve our overall perceived performance. We improve our latency. So the user does not even know that the page has you know, switched from another one to another one without any reloading of your entire application. Okay, so yeah, so, so that's what we did. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of demonstration. Where's the other side, other side? Yep. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, full screen. I'll just click it, yeah. Here we go. Okay, um, so yeah, so this is um, code splitting and React Router in action. So as you can see, it doesn't reload the page and it only loads what chunk is needed. So home page and then about and then contact. So we, with, with that in mind, with um, skip, skip. There we go. Okay. So back, 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 back. Okay. So yeah, so we, we already improved the performance of, of our website by just doing those um, three things, okay? So, but we still want more. We still want to give our, um, our um, users a little bit more. So, okay. So with that, we also added um, lazy loading to our um, images because we are a very, very image heavy website. So K-pop fans only love to look at pictures. Sometimes they don't even read the, the articles. They just look at pictures of their idols. So by lazy loading our images, we significantly save a vast amount of data, if also for our mobile users and for our web users. So what we did is like we load first a low resolution image, and then once that um, part of the web website comes into view, then we load the actual image. So it is actually waiting there to be loaded. Okay, so, and also, um, <clears throat> like, like w have you ever went to a website and then 
it, it starts with white screen for like five seconds and, or, or 10 seconds. So people would, would just want to leave. If like, how come this is loading? This might be like consuming a vast amount of data. What is this website going, doing to my data plan? It's good. I'm going to get out of this, so they're not going to come back anymore. So we did code splitting. Our, our codes are very, very slim, very, very minimal. And we also need to defer our um, assets from loading. So they will load one, one at a time, and they will not wait for each other. It will start the first paint already, and your website will be visible for everybody in, in just a split second. Okay, so, yep, so, so that's, that's everything that we did, right? But where do we put all this? Where do we, where do we serve this? Where do, where, do we, um, where do we deploy this thing? So yeah, as, as Weiwen mentioned, we uh, deployed this to Google App Engine, uh, Flex environment. Um, it's because it's, it's very easy to, to configure. For us, we just deploy and then that's it. We, can, we even ask our, our um, cloud builder to deploy it for us. So you just have to wait and then it's there. Then boom, a new version is up. So, and plus it's, um, it's auto scale. So it can scale um, um, very, very fast with, without even us you know, doing anything. Okay, so, so <clears throat> but of course, you're, you're all not here for the story, right? You wanna see the numbers. You wanna see how, how, how did the rewrite go? This guy is talking so, so many things about you know, improving this, improving that. But you wanna see the numbers, right? So, and on that note, I'm gonna give the floor back to Wei-Yen to explain a little bit more about the metrics after the rewrite. Thanks, Amir. Okay, so let's uh, look at the res results of our entire rewrite that we did over the last year. Okay. Before we begin, let me first uh, talk about the tool that we are using to profile the performance of individual web pages. So we're using speed curve. Uh, that allows us to profile, you know, when you load the page, the, when you hit the DOM content loader, when it re renders the entire page, stuff like that. Okay, so from here, we're able to split our metrics down to three different categories. Okay, first category, perceived latency. So from perceived latency, you could derive this, sorry, you can derive this uh, from metrics such as the DOM content loader time, as well as the visually complete time. Okay, so perceived latency is important to us not because you know, it's related to latency, but rather it's the speed that the user thinks your site is loading at. So by having better perceived latency, this means that you're, you're able to engage your users earlier you know, while your site is loading. So that's to prevent them from you know, leaving your site for some other website. Okay? So you can see you know, for both of those metrics, we had uh, rather good improvements. Okay, second category, actual latency itself. So after we write, you can see that for both of these metrics, we had a huge increase or rather uh, improvement in the latency metrics. Okay, so very clear cut. You have better latency, your site loads faster, better user experience. Okay, last category, bandwidth savings. So for bandwidth savings, we're referring to the different types of files that you download within the site as your page initialized. So you have stuff like uh, HTML size, CSS, JS, so on and so forth. Again, we have huge improvements after we did this rewrite. Okay, so bandwidth savings is important not just for the server side, sorry, not just for client side, but also for the server side. Okay, for the server side, uh, having bandwidth savings means that you're able to do more with less. Okay, and as well as for our client side, there's actually two benefits. Lesser things to download, better latency. Okay, and another benefit is that, let's say, uh, so I'll illustrate using a scenario. Let's say I have a limited data cap of 1 GB per month. You know, and I'm loading this site. It takes 100 MB to load this site. So that's like 10% of my monthly quota use up you know, in just one single load. So that's an extreme put off in terms of you know, user experience. I don't really want to visit this site again. Okay? So here you can see how bandwidth requirements actually translates to user experience. Okay, so what are the takeaways that uh, we, gain, uh, we learn from this rewrite? Okay, so some learnings and pitfalls. One of our points is that uh, we realized that we should have uh, started with writing our React components in a separate node module, you know, instead of within the application itself. So this will allow us to share this uh, reusable components you know, across other services that we write in the future. Okay. 
Another thing is Universal JS. So we are writing a Universal JS application, but this also means that for newer engineers, you know, when they onboard on the project, they might get confused between, you know, when your server side assets start and, you know, when it goes to a client side assets. So this might result in situations where the secrets, you know, leak to your client uh, assets. So we make sure that, you know, checks and balance are there, PRs are done properly, you know, make sure these things doesn't happen. Okay. Another thing is by using App Engine, we're able to take advantage of a GCP's environment ecosystem, such that we're able to use Stack Driver to do monitoring, logging, and tracing out of the box. Okay. And to build on top of this, we build alerting mechanisms to let us know, uh, you know, when the system health is deteriorating. Okay. And lastly, a pitfall that we learn about using App Engine is that it's actually the offering for App Engine is a single uh, region, you know, per project. And this is very hard if we want to regionally scale in the future. You know, something that we need to reconsider in the future. Okay, so last slide. Uh, okay, so in the future, what do we intend to do? Okay, one of the things that we want to achieve is why not use Next.js to create our single page application instead of reinventing the wheel using React Router. Okay, and in rewriting this application, we take note of, you know, different performance metrics, but one of the things that we did not take note of was site accessibility. So that's another thing that we should look into. Okay, third point, tree shaking. Okay, this one is a little bit peculiar because, you know, we just rewrote the app, you know, where's the legacy code, the tree shake? But the thing is this, the legacy code doesn't come across the course of one single day. You have legacy code that builds up, redundant code builds up over time. So build your tree shaking mechanisms early so that you can reduce this build out. Okay, and lastly, building on to our system alerts, why not put in performance alerts? You know, this entire rewrite was caused by performance issues in the first place. Put in your performance alerts so that you can notify yourself when the performance is degrading, you know, when you are shipping something in production. Okay, so that, you know, you can notify us when, when we can, uh, when we should rewrite the code that we ship, you know, if it's causing some performance deterioration. Hey, so that's the end of uh, this talk. So I hope you enjoyed it. Your project, or rather the talk for the project focused mainly on the front end side of things. Yep. So yep. I'm wondering what did you replace your WordPress CMS with? You want to take this? Yeah. Okay. So we did not actually replace WordPress as our um, CMS. So it's still there. Uh, we're still using it. The, the, our, the, the editors are still using it. We only replaced the front end. So by, 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 by splitting the front end um, side into two parts, so instead of like rendering everything in WordPress, so we split the front end with React, and then the editors just go and log into WordPress and then do their stuff. Yeah. Um, yes, we, we, we did a uh, headless CMS, yeah. Okay. Should we save all the... Yeah. I guess maybe one other thing that I want to note is the backend component. So like, where do you get the API? Like, you know, this front-end application needs to make API calls to somewhere. So we did, uh, so besides the CMS, which we retained using WordPress, we wrote, uh, we rewrote our backend applications, or rather we created a backend application in conjunction with this. Uh, that's done using Golang. So after you move to the um, WordPress project, right? How about the SEO part? SEO, SEO. Yeah, SEO. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Okay. So, um, so we uh, we mentioned like um, it's isomorphic, right? So we also did server side rendering on 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 this part. So we we you uh, we use um, Node.js as our server and it um, renders everything. So it, it, it actually uses the same component that we use on the front end. Yeah. So just to add a little bit more to that, so server-side render, we add in information. So the first load that comes in, there's already data there. So for f SEO purposes, yeah, you know, when bots crawl through, even for bots that doesn't understand JavaScript, at least there's some data for them to scrape. Yeah. 